Okay. Today we're going to speak briefly about Genji. Um, this is a long work, and I asked you to read the first half of it as excerpted in the book. Um, for today, the second half by next week. Um, I really wanted to do this work um, in the entirety of what we have in the excerpts. This is the full book. Bam! Uh, I have not read the full book, I fully admit that. Um, I have read considerable chunks of it. Uh, and I think it's, you know, just fantastic. But it is an awful lot of an investment to get through, quite honestly. Uh, I highly encourage everybody to do that and put that on that bucket list thing. You know, you just flip through a couple of pages a night. Over time, it adds up. Um, the excerpted form that we have is, uh, is quite good. For, I think it's like in the anthology, I, I think it's like roughly 200 pages. And, you know, they're long pages. This is the first time we're reading something in class where it's not poetry, so it goes from margin to margin. And that's an awful lot of words per page to get through. Whereas, you know, when you're doing the Iliad, you just kind of flying through that stuff. Um, so this is a considerable amount of reading. I am not unaware of this. Uh, just do your best to keep up. The uh, the second most daunting uh, aspect of this is the uh, the specificity of the world that you're entering into. And here, it's almost made harder by the fact that. Uh, it's such a piece of, uh, uh, it's such a masterpiece, it's such a work of genius, because the writer, Shikibu Murasaki, is so good at rendering this world, this entire universe in such rich detail that she knows every little aspect, every little nook and cranny of her culture, but it's a very narrow culture and it can be a little bit overwhelming. A very, it's a difficult uh, step to try and get into her world. Uh, that world is the Heian Empire from what is that? 794 to 1185 of the Common Era, as they put. Um, I don't want to get too into the uh, um, the history because that can get awfully hairy. But just in the broad outlines. Not unlike the outlines for uh, for England and the uh, uh, Scandinavia as a background for Beowulf, the broad outlines of the culture are important. Um, this is an extraordinarily uh, sophisticated culture. This is an extraordinarily detailed and organized and structured culture. There is um, a remarkable gulf in the relative sophistication levels between Beowulf and this. They're coming about at roughly the same time in history, but these people are very cultured, they're very sophisticated, 
and they're very refined. And Beowulf, I think we can all agree, there's really none of those things. There's a famous um, book review by the uh, British author Virginia Woolf, who, trans who uh, reviewed a translation of this work by uh, a guy named Arthur Wally or Whaley, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, that came out roughly 100 years ago. Um, and she marveled at how, like, you know, how delicate and refined this world war was when at the same time her people, the British, were just a bunch of, you know, croaking barbarians. It's a... Uh, it's a fun review to read. Um, but there are a few characteristics of this culture that make it important for understanding the work itself. Uh, in, in reading this, I think some of the words that I've hit on are kind of obvious. Refined, st structured, disciplined, excellent. Anybody else? What will describe that? What's this world like? Conservative in what way? Um, it was just like a lot of formalities. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, touching on, oh, I don't know, a uh, an essay topic or two. What's the uh, what's the role of women like? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm with this woman because she's not going to do this. Just seeing this object. That was a Woody Allen. <laughs> Woody Allen, okay. Objectification. Um, <laughs> I'm not going near the Woody Allen stuff. Um, yeah, anybody else? Other impressions of this world? <laughs> It's a bizarre world. It is ridiculously conservative in many respects. Um, an interesting little uh, fact of political history that I find instructive is that the Heian lasted for, you know, a nice stretch of time there. Yeah, you're on top for quite a while. Uh, they were eventually ousted as the uh, uh, outside forces started marshalling against them by a group, well, basically, uh, Shogun. the Shogunate. And the specifics don't need to uh, really, uh, we don't need to dwell on that. But basically, the shogunate is a uh, warrior king, warrior kingdom. Essentially, the same culture that gives the, wor the world the samurai. And if you've ever seen a samurai movie, which I highly recommend, they're basically cowboys with swords. They are uh, knights in shining armor in Japan. They are warriors who go around in the wild west of Japan. It is a warrior culture. We're back in the world of Beowulf, of the Iliad, of Macho Men. They superseded this. The contrast, I think, is instructive. Whereas 
the shogunate culture is a warrior culture, um, a very masculine culture, a very active culture. By contrast, the Heian, uh, not so much. I would say, in many respects, it is a fairly feminine culture, and we'll talk about that. It is a fairly, uh, I don't know, active, but in weird ways, a passive culture. And it's extremely, and the word I used before, I'm going to focus on, refined. It's hard to imagine a work as subtle and delicate as Genji coming out of this. Um, and understanding it in that framework is a little limiting, it's a little restrictive, but I think it's a it's a reasonable pathway in. This was a uh, work of literature by a woman, which in the, uh, the period we're talking about you know, is fairly rare. There aren't very many women writers in the ancient world. There aren't very many women writers in the medieval era either. When they do come about, is generally in very rare circumstances. Shikibu Murasaki is a uh, is an aristocrat. She is attached to the imperial court, which gives her certain privileges. Now, you know, some of these are simply. <clears throat> Economic. She doesn't have to you know, uh, toil in the fields or take care of the chickens while her husband toils in the fields to scratch together enough food for the dead. She is not, well, coming from a family attached to the, uh, the imperial court. She does not get an education on her own per se, but just being in the family unit helps considerably. She writes at certain points about how her brother would have tutors come over, and she would sit out in the hall and listen as they tried to drill this, guy, this kid, who's apparently not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Uh, they would try and teach him all that he needed to know to be a responsible advisor to the emperor, which he was being, you know, raised to be. That was his function in life. She was just supposed to look pretty, be ornamental. But she stood outside that door and listened. And was able to take in a lot of the education that was basically not for her. She learned how to write Chinese, an important aspect of Japanese culture was the, uh, the large footprint China made on it. China was much bigger, just across the water, and was generally considered the uh, the leading culture of the region. The court functioned uh, on Chinese writing, Chinese language, um, Chinese forms of law. Her idiot brother had to learn all that stuff and apparently wasn't very good at it. She was able to suck in an awful lot of it, an awful lot of the educational, an awful lot of the uh, Chinese classics like the Analects. She was able to 
learn to read and think about it. This was all going on while Japanese was developing its own literary traditions. The, um, the Japanese language was a little bit, uh, was derivative of Chinese, but it had some, uh, it had some new directions, some new possibilities. Um, Mm, a lot of it, in a literary form, took the form of the Mona, how do you spell this? Going from uh, alphabet to alphabet tends to make spelling inconsistent and difficult to remember. So I am really up against the wall on this one. The Mona Gatari, Mona Gatari is a long epic. Essentially, like national epics uh, uh, known in the West, like the Iliad and Aeneid and others like that. Um, but written in Japanese, it generally takes a uh, prose form. Um, where is the other one? Where is the other one? Where is the other one? I know I've got it somewhere. Yeah, and this is all part of the kana writing system. Let me just put those two up there. But these are prose, generally. Prose, and it's kind of remarkable how this develops on a global scale. Prose is generally considered uh, less impressive. It is less formal than poetry. Real men write and read poetry, generally <coughs> Chinese poetry. Um, that is the mark of distinction. That is the pathway to government service, which was the best job, working for the emperor. If you wanted to be seen as a serious scholar, an intellectual, somebody worth listening to, you had to know how to read and write poetry. Prose, eh, a little less structured, a little less disciplined. It tended to come in the vernacular Japanese language instead of the more formal uh, Chinese. So it tended to be adopted by people who were not trying to impress, who were not trying to use it for social advancement. People like women. Many traditions will call Genji the first novel it is written in prose. It is deeply personal. It is about people rather than the founding of a nation. Um, the novel has, from the very beginning, been considered a woman's form all the way up into the height of the novel, and uh, generally considered, most people say it solidified as a form in the 1800s. Up until then, still, eh, the novel was considered less serious, less important. You know, not macho. Real men write poetry. So, This is coming about with, this whole work of literature is coming about in a very specific 
and rarefied context where language itself is a kind of identifier where the uh, function of women is very circumscribed. Murasaki is attached to a court, not necessarily, uh, you know, an active player within it, but her job is to be there uh, for the entertainment of the empress and other members of the royal family. And she starts writing because she has this education. She starts writing, scribbling things down, saying, oh, here's a little scene I just thought of. This is sort of funny. And over time, people start to notice, hey, these are pretty good. You know, it's good stuff. You got a knack for this. One after the other after the other, they stack up. But everything she had to go by was fairly limited. The old writing advice, write what you know, what did she know? She knew how to sit around uh, looking very prim and proper in an extremely limited setting and, well, that's it. She's not getting out there and meeting a whole lot of people. She's sitting in the court and meeting other people from the court. You don't come across an awful lot of, uh, you know, ordinary people in this book. As long as it is, and as comprehensive as it is of her world, you're not meeting a lot of farmers. You're not meeting a lot of people who are on the lower ends of the social scale in any way. She is very precise about a very narrow field of expertise. But that tends to be what novels are today. And in a way, she invented it. Um, let me see, who is doing oral presentations today? Who wants to talk? Samantha, Dorita, anybody else? Anybody, anybody? No, no, okay. Um, hmm, do either of you have anything that you are, like, did, are you showing anything, you're projecting anything, do you have any spiel you want to get out at the beginning? I, that was just the usual, like, last question. Okay, we can handle this in a number of different ways, is that okay with you, Dorita? Um, I just wanted to add, um, to the, to the idea that you presented, that it's a feminine society. That I also, while I was reading it, and like now that I'm very, I'm comparing it to other readings that we've done before, men are uh, described very strong, very big, very tough, and uh, in this in this novel, um, Genji is described just very handsome, and um, that's about it. Just handsome, you know, very handsome. Mm -hmm. Like that's the quality that they. Language is touchy in translation, and it always is, uh, so you can't hang too much on it. But yeah, you're onto something there. He, uh, his, his looks are yeah. referenced repeatedly, and sometimes, I mean, uh, the the uh, the the word isn't handsome so much that they use so much as beautiful. beautiful yeah. He is beautiful. He is the shining Genji, or or, or was it the yeah, the valiant yeah, prince in different translations? Yeah. And yeah, he is spoken of in uh, fairly effeminate terms. Mm -hmm. He has long, beautiful hair. hair yeah. That's uh, <coughs> in many different cultures. That is uh, considered a sign of the aristocracy, <coughs> however. And especially in certain cultures that uh, you, you see that again uh, in later French history, where one group is known for wearing their hair very long, and then, uh, who is it, I think Charlemagne comes along and he has very short hair because he's a warrior. 
And when you have long hair and you're fighting, uh, people can pull your hair. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, life is a schoolyard. And so long hair is considered very elegant and very refined. You are, you know, very delicate. But, you know, if you're working for a living, short hair is really much more practical. You see that in the Romans, you see it in the French, it's, it's sort of traditional. But yeah, there's a lot of emphasis on the, the flowing hair that he has and how uh, it's a very effeminate beauty. And we can talk about that an awful lot. Yeah. Okay. So in the moment where he's becoming a man, you know, like where the ceremony goes on, even the emperor itself is like, oh, I feel bad because now his beauty is going to fade a little. Yeah, so well, you know, so once you hit 13, it's all downhill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm the valley beneath that. Uh, okay, Samantha. Yes. How you doing? Good. Why don't we start out with you? Telling me what happens? What's uh, what's the deal with the beginning? Um, the emperor has a wife that he loves a lot. You speak up a little. I'm way over here. Okay, so the emperor has a wife or a woman that yeah, words he likes the most out of all of them. Um, it just causes a stir of jealousy to where I guess the woman who had his name, the baby who's the rightful heir, he was very threatened by her and her baby that's coming out. So her and the other woman of the court pretty much start bullying her very cruelly to the point where it affects her health. And her health keeps diminishing, but the emperor doesn't really pay mind to it. He selfishly just wants her there. And she pretty much dies afterwards giving birth. <laughs> Pretty much does. I like that. Uh, I also like the word bully. Let's uh, let's pause right there. Um, yeah. Uh, the first thing you said. The emperor has one wife he particularly likes. A lot. Polygamous society. Uh, the emperor has you know. There is a principal wife, but then there's some others. And then there's, you know, a few others that aren't quite wives, and, you know, just girls you hang out with, but, you know. Um, yeah, it's good to be the king. <sighs> he takes a particular liking to one of them. Um, she was, like, second tier. She was the top tier. That was another reason why. Yes. In a very formal society, where you are from, what your family is and has done, it's very important. And this one woman that he particularly likes, among all the rest, you know, uh, not quite the other side of the tracks, Shady, but, you know, uh, not, not the sterling reputation that perhaps the principal wife enjoys. And the principal wife tends to notice this. And they're very um, conscious of this favoritism that is suddenly going on. And it is tinged with that class consciousness. Like, you know, what, is, what does he see in her? It is very, very, uh, and here we can universalize a little bit out of the world of, you know, first millennium Japan, uh, it's very high school. Everybody's talking about one another behind one another's back. Everybody is saying, well, you know, what's so special about her? And they're always whispering about it. They're always gossiping. Nobody's coming right out and confronting the emperor. You don't do that. Even, you know, the first uh, principal wife or whatever, who's the favorite, or not the favorite, but, you know, the number one wife, she's not coming right out and saying, you know, it's her or me. No. She knows her place. She knows her status. It doesn't challenge him in the slightest. It is a status among the other women. And she's 
very conscious and jealous, I believe is another word you use, of that status among the other women. Why should she get all the attention that's supposed to be for me? Why is he spending so much time with her kid when my son is the heir? It's very, uh, it's very high school. It's very jealous. It's very gossipy. They're all talking about one another behind their backs, talking primarily about the new girl. And it's very hidden. But now think of uh, think of the world that they're in. This is a world of paper screens. Most of the homes were large rooms with paper screens separating rooms. Some of them would slide, some of them would fold, but the point is everything happens just out of view, but you know what's going on. It's a very secretive society that way, but open secrets. Everybody knows everything that's going on, and yet it's still hidden, and supposed to be. Think of that dynamic. What does that do? When you are in the world where you see evidence of everything, but you don't actually see it, you're putting it all together. When you were saying that of the screen, the way it just made sense as to why the men all the way in different things and why the women go over. There's a lot of separation. There are a lot of barriers. Some of it is, uh, you know, cultural, but you don't challenge the barriers. But more to the point. A paper screen, light will pass through. You can see a shadow very often from the other side. And you don't know what exactly is going on there, but you can deduce from the shadows. You might not hear what's happening, but maybe you can sense a tone. What is this but reading? The act of reading is the act of interpreting, of peering in and seeing, well, what is really going on here? It says something on the surface, but what's really happening beneath the surface? Now, in some of the, uh, some of the earlier works of literature, we've talked about the exterior um, portrayal, where everything, particularly in like uh, the Iliad, everything in that world was on the surface. If somebody had a thought, they would usually express it, sometimes non-verbally by going up and clubbing someone in the head. But you get a sense of what they mean when they do that. This is a different world. This is a much subtler world. This is a much more hidden world. Everything in this book is going on in the interior. There isn't much going on on the exterior. You know, uh, there's a guy who likes a series of girls, and he goes after them, and sometimes it's a little creepy. Uh, you know, the story itself on the surface isn't that much. But it's all about what people have going on inside. It's all about the thoughts. We don't have terribly many scenes. Look how little dialogue there is 
particularly in the beginning. The whole drama with Genji's mother and the emperor plays out pretty much without dialogue. Nobody actually says anything. You just have a lot of people or references to people whispering behind your back. Oh, yeah, I don't really like her very much. So you get this portrayal of a culture where nothing is explicit, nothing is clear, nothing is on the surface. Everything needs to be puzzled out, interpreted, read. People need to be read just like any work of literature. This is what the novel tends to do particularly well. It takes you into a culture and exposes you to a full world around you, and you need to orient yourself. You need to figure out, well, what is going on here? What are the dynamics? Nothing is explained all that clearly. It can be quite maddening to read. Well, no, the Nothos cheated, and it skips, and I was like, wait, did I just miss something? It really is, like, you have to read between the lines. It's so subtle. Yeah. There, some of this is, uh, some of this is formal. Some of this is a, is a condition of the, uh, some of the difficulty in reading is a condition of just the way this was written. And translators and editors have, uh, have had a, uh, a hard time in the past just trying to make it more accessible to modern audiences. Not even Western audiences, but modern audiences. In the original, there are character, char in the original, characters are always identified by the jobs they, uh, they hold in that society. You know, uh, I would be professor. Terrific. It's clear everybody knows who I am. But what if I get a promotion? Or what if I change jobs and change titles? The original audience would be expected to keep up with that when suddenly this same character is called by something completely different and you haven't really been given that memo. So it's a little bit of a challenge culturally to keep up with what's happening with this. But again, that is an indication of the level of, of attention expected by this work of literature to this world. Now, she was writing. Remember how uh, Murasaki is writing this? She is writing this for her narrow group of friends, really. Friends. It's called Coterie Literature, C-O-T something, Uri where you are writing for a very simple and distinct group of people. And you can rely on them knowing a lot of the same stuff and being aware of it. And she was taking a lot of this, it is speculated by many, from real life. So when she writes about one character doing something, everybody who's reading it goes, I know who she's writing about. <laughs> So there's a little bit of an in-joke culture going on there. And that also, since we are not in that world, that is also very difficult to overcome. But it just feeds back into that idea of, okay, this is just another screen that we need to read through. So while it's a little bit unintentional, it actually feeds into the larger concept of the work as we have it, which is convenient, but probably not something she was able to plan for. I couldn't imagine this girl, and she died fairly young, too, this girl writing all of this with much of a sense that it would be kicking around uh, a thousand years later. You know, it's just something she wrote for friends. <sighs> Genji is born. What happens from there? Uh, the Emperor loves him. He's so good looking. And because it's a Japanese culture, is very superstitious. They're worried it can attack jealousy and demons. Um, 
wanted. Jealousy is very real. Demons are not. But the jealousy is probably scarier than the demons. Why? Well, you see how conniving the women and people can be. So they didn't want to basically made him a commoner. Yeah. They didn't put him in court officially as a result. They um, gave him a last name, too. They gave him like a full commoner's name. He was supposed to be, you know, the emperor's son, but the emperor knew because, as you say, uh, people were often quite conniving. They're not coming up to him and saying, yeah, your son, uh, turn your back, I'm going to kill him. Yeah, if, if you die young, he's going to be gone in about a week. His head will be on a stick, and that'll be that. Nobody says that, but he is reading that into the situation. He understands that that is what's going on on the inside of the people around him. Uh, so he decided, much pleased to his first wife, to make the right for the Prince? I forget the name. Something Prince. And yeah, then he just stopped from there and he's getting older. Ended up talking about women for a very long time. Who is they who are talking about women? Um, it's, it's, uh, so now I guess they're older. It's Genji and uh, I forget his name. But it's someone from the court. It's two guys. The uh, Tono Chujo is his brother-in-law. He's been married off. Uh, the marriage traditions can be a little bit hard to identify with because uh, he gets married to this girl. She's a couple of years older than he is. She seems a little bit more impervious to his flowing beauty that everybody is so enraptured with. Uh, and, you know, not a lot of chemistry there, but you know, he was probably married when he was, like, I think 12. So, you know, he's uh, a little young in the heart yet. Um, but his brother-in-law and he are hanging around uh, doing what guys do. They're talking about girls. And, of course, as guys tend to do, uh, they talk more than perhaps they know. Dorita! <clears throat> I'm looking at the scene from chapter 2 that starts on page, like, 1258 or so. But, all right. Well, are you in? Okay. Uh, but specifically, a passage when uh, Tono Chugo, Chujo, ha sorry, names, I, I, I hate names, uh, on, on my page 1260, decides to expound on what he knows about women. And I believe he's married at this point, but again, probably fairly young. And it, it, I, I think we can all agree that, you know, young or old, guys are clueless. Um, what does he say about women? Well, um, he says that has come to the realization that as far as women are concerned, there aren't many who are flawless enough to make you think she's the one. Yeah, that's a quotation. Very good. Yeah, but it's a good one. Yeah, it, it is. It explains the, the concept that they had for women back then. Which is what? Which is, um, like, women has to be raised and, you know, reach certain expectations to be um, worthy of a man. Sure. She hot or not? Perfect 10? Yeah. Hard 5? You know, what's the deal? Here and there. Sure! 
Um, this word got used earlier. Objectification. Uh, women are essentially rated here. And this paragraph that you just quoted from is a great one. Uh, they're talking about letters. He and Genji are hanging out, doing guy stuff. Written a little bit later in life, they'd be sitting there playing Fortnite. Um, but they come across a box of love letters and uh, of Gen Genji's love letters and his brother-in-law, whatever his name is, um, totally blanking, uh, starts you know speculating. I'm going to point out. They're talking about letters. Whenever you're reading something and they start talking about letters or writing of any kind, I want to stay attuned to the little hairs on the back of your neck where you're aware that, well, wait a minute. This is a writer having characters talk about writing. Hmm. What's on this writer's mind? There's a couple of, uh, you know, next level meta things going on here. Uh, you must have a great number of letters at your place, said Genji. I'd really love to take a peek at them. If you let me, I'll gladly open this cabinet to you. Now remember, Genji is not necessarily uh, faithful in conventional parlance, and this is his brother-in-law that he's hanging out with. Obviously they're good friends, and hey, they're secrets among guys, it's a guy code, but still, there's that little undercurrent that, well, you know, these letters might be from somebody with whom Genji is, uh, got a little side thing going on behind little sister's back. So there's that reading into the dynamic. You don't see it, but it's there. I have very few worth looking at, Tono Chujo answered. You see, I've come to the realization that as far as women are concerned, there aren't many who are flawless enough to make you think she's the one. I've come across many who have passable skills in the arts, who can write flowing characters that create an impression of superficial elegance, who show a kind of facile understanding of how to respond in verse on certain occasions. Yet even when one chooses a woman on the basis of such accomplishments, she almost always fails to live up to the expectations created by her talents and disappointments in the end. What is remarkable about this passage? Some of the same dynamics I find remarkable in Shakespeare. They're saying that even if a girl is educated, that's not a quality or like a reason why you should marry her. Because um, <clears throat> as life goes on, she's going to disappoint you in that area. Yeah. So yeah, that's not a criteria, a good criteria to manage. Yeah, okay. Um, you get a sense in this very refined culture that culture itself is a bit of a priority. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that often in, uh, let's say, uh, contemporary life that a woman is rated for her ability to write a good letter. You know? Wow. Yeah, did you see that, babe? She's got one hell of a vocabulary on her. I tell you, boom! Uh, it's, it's a more refined thing. He is placing a value on her ability, this mythical woman's ability, to express herself in a refined and cultured way. She can write a good letter. Write a good letter. Um, 
But that alone isn't necessarily something you can trust. Samantha. Even within, it's not just a simple letter, it feels more godly based on like, stroke, like the poetry's response and reference. Mm hmm. Syntax of the undertones. Yeah. They're writing on a fairly, I'm going to say, superficial on one level, but also an inferential, what you can draw from it level. Now, again, Think of the context. It's never about what's right there on the page here. It's always about what's happening beneath the page. Who is this? The writer. The writer. Give me a gender. Woman! A woman! Uh, Tono Chujo is Gen Genji's <coughs> brother-in-law. From this, we can infer he is a he, correct? Okay. Three-dimensional chess here. We have a woman writer putting what is arguably a fairly reductive and sexist judgment of women in the act of writing, down, and doing it in writing. When? Well, first of all, what's the impression you get of Tono Chujo here? Just, you know, anybody. Ladies, if you heard this guy talking at this moment, you just walked into the room, and he was in the middle of this little speech, and you overheard part of it coming in. Uh, what's your impressive? What's your What's your impression? What's that? I, I personally find it funny. Funny? Because it's like they have all these expectations, but yet they were so flawed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would listen just to hear a male's perspective, but I just find it funny. Sure, because guys are stupid. And, you know, you can go to the other side of the globe a thousand years into history, and you know what? Guys are still stupid. Not much changes. Do you think that it's easy to come right out and say that? Toto Chujo is an aristocrat. He is a member of the, uh, the imperial court. He is a very substantial human being in that culture that highly conservative, stratified, rigid culture. You don't talk smack about him. But, Murasaki Shikibu is able to craft this little scene, which you have to read, where you can deduce for yourself that he is uh, you know, yeah, it's funny. It's funny to the degree that he's kind of a jackass. He's kind of immature. He is doing, you know, a hot or not type rating system here. That's what he is saying. Yeah, he is saying no woman is really worth it, but at the same time, what is your impression of him in the act of saying it? That he is not worth it, so what does his opinion matter? Less, I would say. So it complicates all this. So if you want to go, you know, uh, social criticism route, she is able, because she is a woman, not really allowed to talk smack about men too objectively, she is able to couch a term where you have a character who is relatively new at the, uh, to the scene at this point. We know very little about him before this. He is able to just come out, give this uh, speech where he is criticizing women, but in the act of doing so, makes himself look a little bit more foolish. 
It's never said explicitly, and I defy you to find a line where it says Tono Chujo is a jackass. But if you are reading carefully and digging through the letters and inferring from them what you think this actually means because you can't see it, there's a screen there, literally a screen on the page. If you can peel that back, and dig out that meaning, it's suddenly much more significant. It's much more significant because it's not explicit. It's implicit. It is something you discover on the inside. Something much more uh, interesting. Something much more complex. You can argue this any different number of ways. People can read that speech and say, well, yeah, he really put a button on that culture. <laughs> Women aren't worth anything. Bless you. Thank you. Some people, yeah, they're all superficial. They can write. Big deal. Writing is BS. Nobody cares. Anybody can write to make it look on the surface pleasant. <clears throat> But if you can write something on the surface while still being ultimately worthless, that is suggesting right there that there are two levels to function at. There's a surface level and then an underneath level. And it's the underneath level that he is saying is where the real substance lies. So that's where you really are going to learn something significant. And that's what the book is telling you everywhere. And it's no accident that this comes early on in the book, beginnings and endings. It's telling you that the value of learning anything is about looking underneath, not taking the surface for granted. The surface is very conservative. It's very formal. It's very objectified. There is no social mobility or distinction in this culture. The emperor is the emperor. Everything else is subservient to that. The very first beginnings and endings words are, I believe, in the time of blank. Oh, in whose reign was it that a woman rather of rather undistinguished, in whose reign was it? In other words, who is the emperor at this time? Because that's really what we start with. Everything radiates down from the emperor into I. Everything comes from that. In that locked down, rigid society where everybody has very polite rules, where you're not allowed to just, you know, act out, what forms of expression are open to you? Letters, yeah. Letters that, and even that, I mean, how many people get in trouble for writing something? that they, uh, you know, maybe wish they hadn't written. I think the unending lesson of social media is don't put it into words. <laughs> Imply, but have a little plausible deniability. Be aware of the form in front of you that you can push against a little, but it's really just the shadow that's going to be, uh, be read. That's why they use poetry. Instead of like explicitly learned. Yeah, you need to read into something. It's re it's not, the lines are one thing, but it's reading between the lines that is where all the meaning lies. And just think about how many references throughout this book you have to gossip. Gossip is something that nobody says out front and you know chats about in the open, but they whisper it behind them. Behind this closed door. It's very hidden. It's very subterranean. It is uh, dishonest, yeah. But, you know, this dishonest is such an ugly word. I'm going to go with art. Gossip is a form of art because it represents itself one way, but underneath it's something completely different. Now, you know, you use a, uh, uh, the word conniving. Sure. That's a little nasty. I mean, someone, I mean, a woman got possessed from another 
other one because of jealousy and gossip. So. And not everyone. I would never say for a minute that from time to time, uh, you know, we're going to give you a little uh, nutso. Well, I'm not saying all, and that all the gossip is nice, but they definitely do get, some of the women do get. Sure. There's a, uh, there's a fair gradation of uh, cruelty, personality, uh, how much backstabbing they're really willing to do. It's got kind of like a Real Housewives of Medieval Kyoto feel. Um, but again, if you saw all of the wives of the emperor lined up, and I'm sure there were instances where they were lined up, what would you see? Would you see clicks hanging out would you see people sitting there, you know, yeah, that, that bitch can't stand her? Uh, or would they all be just standing very politely, conservative, formal, refined? But man, you look into those cold steel eyes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Reading a human being is like reading a book. It takes a little discipline, it takes a little focus. It's not all on the surface. You can't trust what's on the surface. Eliana? That's why in many of the sayings they describe a lot of cartoons. Like, like describing the behind yes. cartoons, they're going to talk about you. Even though with the watch as the watch as it unfolds, curtains, screens, doors, windows. Um, there's an awful lot about dress, which is another way of blocking a view, of putting something between one person and the other. There's a remarkable number of repetitions of these items throughout. What sleeves? Sleeves are a thing. You mentioned, you know, I noticed there, I don't know if that was your way of saying they were crying. They would always mention. Always There's an awful lot going on on a symbolic level because symbolism, metaphor, is another way of putting something between, you know, the thing and its meaning. Um, or and its perceiver rather. It's another layer of meaning that needs to be decoded. Uh, and you know, we don't have time to go through all of the uh, all of the symbols at play there. Um, and I would say that part of the fun as you're reading is just saying, well, now, well, yeah, there's that thing again. When I was rereading it this time. And I've read it again, like, several times before. I was uh, coming up with all these references, like, wait a minute, he's talking about weather again. Now, you know, sometimes that's just what a writer does when they're, you know, looking to pass from one scene to another. You know, suddenly it was a dark and stormy night, blah, 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 blah. But it happens repeatedly. And every time a writer does something repeated, why? It's not that different from the ancient era when it was all carved into stone and every repetition you gotta wonder, well, geez, that's just that much more stone you gotta lug around. This, very delicate on paper, but still, a repetition is there for a very distinct purpose. Why? I don't honestly know. And I am kind of obsessed with the weather descriptions. When it is sleeting, when it is raining, when it is cloudy, there's always something going on when they mention weather before a scene. It's not just a superficial um, scene setting. It's not just decoration. I think the whole point of this book is that, yeah, women are kind of used as decoration. Um, Everything is kind of decoration. All of these screens are decorative. 
look at Japanese screens and they're elaborate. It's not just a white sheet or something. Bell will very frequently have very intricate drawings on them. Decoration has meaning. Um, when we come back next week, I'm going to go through some of the uh, some of the artwork. There was an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art just last spring, I think, um, on artwork derived from this story. This is a huge cultural landmark in the history of Japan that in the West we're still sort of coming to terms with because the first translation of it into English didn't happen until the late 1800s, I think, and it wasn't a particularly good one. And there have only been a few since then, and they're all struggling with how to update it and make it accessible. We spoke about that a little bit earlier, but it is a very difficult work to try and translate, not just word for word, but from culture to culture. The language itself was written in a highly um, elite idiom that, bless you, just a few decades after it was written, nobody in Japan could really read anymore. So kind of like how Beowulf happened just before the, uh, the Battle of Hastings and all the, uh, the Norman French came in and started making every, everybody speak French and Old English became extinct. This is another example of a culture that is so refined at a very critical moment in history, and we get this snapshot, this highly detailed world. You read this stuff, and you suddenly realize, like, oh my god, yeah, this is what life is like there, because she's bringing you down to that level. And even when it doesn't seem so detailed, you are so conditioned to be reading into stuff that you can draw out all, all the more details just by inference. Little subtleties of mood or nuance suddenly become much more fruitful than just learning like what they had for breakfast every day. I don't want to get lost. The point is, I'm not going to belabor this too much more. As you're reading, be very aware of what is happening. Be very aware that you are reading because she is sending in little hints, little in-jokes, playing on the fact that people are reading and writing. And there's an awful lot of writing that goes on here. Yes, in this world, people did write poems to one another. It is a sign of uh, your education if you could craft a nice little poem. So when, uh, instead of sending a text message, people would send a short poem to one another. When Genji uh, is hitting on the, the little girl and going through her, uh, and we'll talk about this next time, uh, and he's hitting on the little girl and going through her, her nurse, essentially, he is sending her short poems to demonstrate his worth, his, in, his intentions, his nobility, but he's also signaling that, you know, I'm, I'm a respectable person by doing this. And because I can craft a good poem, that shows I am uh, sophisticated and respectable. But of course, we already know from his friend and brother-in-law that that's not necessarily the case. There's always another fold to the paper. There's always another complication, a new way to interpret what's going on, because you're never told explicitly. It's part of the fun. I know it's a big chunk of reading. I'm not going to say how much is going to show up on the midterm. How integral it will be. But it is at the essence of everything we do here. Because you have to read very deliberately. You have to interpret very contextually. Understand 
everything that's going on at a different time so that you can start to figure it out for yourself because on the paper it doesn't give you a lot of answers. It doesn't really tell you what's going on quite frequently. You need to figure it out for yourself. And that's the skill that we're driving at here. Okay?